Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope you can all uh, see and hear us, and thank you for making the time to come today to our uh, 2020 Dangor Health Tech Challenge run by the NHSA and the UK Israel Tech Hub uh, with the, the, in association with the British Embassy in Israel. Uh, I think we've put together a really great uh, set of speakers here and uh, I'm not going to uh, hold up because I know that they're all very keen to get to talking with you. To start us off, I'm going to introduce uh, Sam Cronin from the Tech Hub, who's going to briefly introduce the session today and the Tech Hub and then lead into our main speakers. Thank you very much and I look forward to hearing your questions as we go through. Over to you, Sam. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, welcome, everybody. I'd just like to thank everybody for participating from the Israeli side, from the UK side. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the UK Israel Tech Hub, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, we're a British government initiative operating out of the British Embassy Israel. And at a basic level, what we do is we work with British industry to help identify their innovation needs and tech challenges and to find uh, relevant solutions being developed by Israeli startups for partnerships. Um, We've been working with the NHSA now for about three years. Uh, I think we started in about 2017. In 2018, we signed an MOU together to help Israeli startups access the clinical research environment in the north of England. Um, the generation of the NHS being, you know, an incredibly evidence-based system and the generation of clinical evidence being an essential part um, of the process. Um, and, and so, you know, towards uh, 2019, we hosted a fantastic delegation at the Biomed conference. Uh, which is essentially what led to, to this happening because, of course, Biomed 2020 was cancelled during COVID, due to COVID. And so from our side, the question really became, how can we try to ensure that um, the partnerships are still being developed from a distance? Um, so without further ado, I just want to say that, you know, we've, we've partnered with these seven fantastic organisations uh, coming from the UK. We've got two hospitals uh, from uh, sort of Leeds and, and Newcastle for NIHR bodies and, of course, the innovation agency AHSN. Um, and they'll be speaking uh, through the afternoon about their unmet clinical needs. This is, of course, a needs based program uh, being you know, led by, by what's by the challenges and, and unmet needs in the UK. Um, and also how these each of these organizations can help support you as Israeli startups in practical terms on the ground in, in England. Um, and lastly, I would just also like to make mention to, uh, to the Dan Gore Foundation, uh, who are partners and sponsors for this program um, and thank them very much for their support. Uh, so I think I shall end there and pass back over to Ben. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Sam. Um, so our next speaker is Mandy Dixon, who is the head of uh, corporate engagement for the Northern Health Science Alliance. And she's going to be giving an overview of the north of England, where we are, what we have to offer, and a sort of a taster of things to come from the rest of the organizations throughout the day. So over to you, Mandy. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the, um, at the NHSA or the Northern Health Science Alliance um, is a membership organisation. Uh, we represent many of the North of England's um, excellence um, in academic and health organisations. Um, we operate at a northern level um, and I'll tell you a, a bit about the north um, for those who don't uh, aren't familiar with it. Um, and, and, and about how we bring people together across the north um, in what is quite a complex landscape. Um, so in, in it, this, the, this slide is um, to show you the, uh, the, the, how we cover the north of England. Um, if you're not familiar with, with England, this is the area from the, um, the Midlands up to the Scottish border. And these are some of the city regions that make up the um, Northern Health Science Alliance. Um, you'll probably be familiar with some of those um, larger cities, um, but, but there are also a, a number of others in between and each has its own specialisms, expertise and so on. Um, and in the top north corner, there is a large national park there. So no, no major cities. Um, that's just to give you a sense of some of the, the cities across the north that we have. Um, next slide, please. If we could um, just perhaps um, step aside of it and think a little bit about the, the north of England and the history, um, just to give you a sense of the place. Um, it has a very strong identity as the north. Um, and you'll often hear mention of the north and the south of England. Um, um, and we have a, a very strong sense of pride. Um, and there are a number of, um, you know, 
famous uh, names and developments, um, scientists, etc., singers um, that, that stem from the north. And you'll again be familiar with some of these and perhaps not others. I won't go through them all, but um, we're very proud, for example, of the discovery of graphene in the north, um, the first computer, first IVF baby, um, Sheffield football team is the oldest in the world. Um, and um, I believe, and, and we have the birth of the NHS in Manchester. So um, that's just to give you a sense of um, some of the, the, the areas of great pride uh, in the North. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to give you a sense of the region in terms of the population, um, we thought this might just give you a bit of context. Um, so we have a population of about 16 million um, and uh, in terms of the, um, the square meter coverage that, that it covers about 37,000 square kilometers. Um, and I think in terms of scale, um, uh, in, in comparison to Israel, this is a, a roughly sort of double the size of the population and uh, nearly double the size um, of the, the actual footprint. Um, so quite a substantial area that we cover across the north. Um, we also have a, a combination of quite densely populated urban areas, as well as um, quite remote populations, um, which are, can often be quite um, useful for things like remote uh, medicine, um, telemedicine and so on. Um, we've got some very large cities, but also some um, very remote areas with its healthcare challenges that come with that. Um, we have a, um, an average life expectancy that's actually two years lower than in the south of England um, and have some very disadvantaged areas in the north um, and, and great inequalities. And we do a lot of work around our inequalities, which you might have um, come across. But we also have, um, possibly as a result of that, some of the best and advanced healthcare systems in the UK as well. And um, often, um, you know, there is um, a, actually a push for some research to take place where it's likely to have the largest impact. So clinical trials and so on in the north, uh, um, you, you are really able to show, um, uh, you know, impact um, because of the high levels of deprivation and so on. Um, and crucially, if the North was a separate country, it would be the equivalent to about the 10th largest economy in Europe. So it's a, a vibrant and active area of the UK. So that gives you a, a sense of it. And um, I'd now just like to move to talk to a bit about our members. Um, so as I mentioned, we are a membership organization. We represent our members and the strengths with, across the North within those members. We have um, 24 members um, and we, of those, 10 of which are universities. So these are world-class research institutions with over 76 Nobel Prizes between them. Um, I'll, I'll give you some more information um, about, about them um, after the next slide, which is um, to show you our 10 NHS um, members that we have as well. Um, and these are, um, I think the, uh, I'll probably just acknowledge that the NHS is a very complex landscape. Um, so we talk about them as NHS trusts. Um, and essentially these are organizations that manage usually a collection of hospitals and um, healthcare delivery organizations um, in a region. Um, so we have 10 of these organizations um, and um, some of which will be talking to you um, in the follow on um, um, presentations. Um, so I won't try and explain the NHS um, in any detail. Um, I've been warned not to because it would uh, take another presentation. But um, suffice to say that um, it is complex, but um, the organizations such as the NHSA and others that will talk after me are there to help you navigate that so that you don't need to be worried about that complexity. Um, and um, in many ways, it can be an advantage because it's, it creates an ecosystem where we work together and potentially offer that opportunity for scaling up, um, given that the ecosystem works so well together. 
So those are our 10 NHS um, members. Um, we also then have um, four, the next slide please, four um, academic health science networks um, or AHSNs, there are lots of acronyms um, as we call them. Um, so these are set up to help increase the rate at which innovation moves from research into frontline adoption. So they work at that interface of healthcare delivery systems and industry to bring technology to that front line, generate benefit for industry partners as well as the, um, the population. And um, they are a network of organisations. So we have 15 of them across the UK and we have four of them in the north. And, and you'll be hearing from, um, from one of them um, in, in the presentation after this um, as well. So I, I'll, I'll let them explain more about what, what, what they do and how they operate, um, but absolutely valuable and essential organisations um, for what we, we're doing today. Um, and they understand the requirements and local unmet needs of their regions. Um, and I think that's, that's an important point to, to note. Um, if I could move to the next slide, please. So this is just to give you a, um, a few statistics about all of our members combined. Um, so yeah, we have um, within this North of England cluster that we have, we've got um, within the universities, we've got over 100,000 graduates. Um, together, the universities bring in over one and a quarter billion pounds research annual income through grants and also through commercial partnerships. Um, they work through from that sort of early drug discovery right through to clinical trials and evaluation and practice. And our um, NHS trusts um, employ over 150,000 staff um, and have a combined turnover of about 6 billion. Um, some of the large ones, like the ones that are talking today, um, having significant budgets. Um, our AHSNs, our four academic health science networks, have worked with over a thousand companies over the last year and have generated more than 58 million revenues for those companies working with industry partners, um, helping to get those technologies into clinical practice. Um, so that's an overview, I think, of the, um, the sort of public sector um, organizations um, in, in addition to that, we have a very strong private industry cluster in the north of England um, that you might be interested in um, and um, that are willing to um, often connect and, and collaborate. Um, we have over a thousand health and life science businesses in the region, um, more than 12 um, you know, large science and innovation parks um, with business of all, sort, all kinds in the health and life sciences sector. And the whole industry for the region generates about 17 and a half billion pounds. And uh, we have about 40,000 jobs with people employed in health and life sciences alone, which is about a fifth of the total UK life science sector workforce. Um, and, and this means that we, um, you know, first of all, we have many partners potentially for collaboration, but we also have a very wide range of support organizations. So for example, around specialist IP, access to finance, law firms, business support firms, um, everything that you need in the, in the region to be supported and to grow and to find people to collaborate with. So um, if we could move on to the next slide. So that gives you a sense of the North, hopefully. And um, our, um, just if I could go back to our, us as an organization, the NHSA, um, our mission, um, so our purpose is to try and take all of that combined potential um, that we have across the North and maximize it for the benefit of the people that live and work here. Um, and to try and eliminate that health gap um, that we mentioned between the North and South and build the North into a prosperous region um, in the world um, and, and develop those connections um, internationally as well. And this is all powered by the research and innovation excellence that we have across all those different areas. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so the role of the NHSA is to work with our members, promote that collective offer that we have, um, you know, internationally and, and within the UK um, on, on their behalf. So, you know, we work on their behalf. That's what we do. Um, we tell the world about the opportunity that exists to work with them, with people like yourselves. 
um, and we act as a front door to to industry um, to navigate to help navigate that complex landscape um, and we work with our members to showcase what their impact is and to um, advocate for policy changes and look for opportunities to secure funding. Um, we, next slide please. Um, we're funded by Research England, um, so the governments and by our members, and we have a set of work programs that we have to deliver on. Um, and we work in a kind of matrix fashion across um, five thematic areas. Um, there's often overlap between these and there are areas outside of these that we work with, but these are the areas that we believe represent our key strengths in the North and um, where we have um, infrastructure that you can tap into. Um, and these include um, translational work around diagnostics and advanced therapies, um, healthy aging, health inequalities, mental health, and data and digital health. Um, so those are our key thematic areas that um, we have um, networks that have been set up and are, have already been set up in some cases um, of experts in those areas. Um, and then we have, um, with our funding, we have four work streams that we, that we work to, um, and that is around cluster development, so building the networks around those areas of strength. Um, we also work to enhance the international profile and promote the excellence of, the, of those networks and our members and look for collaborations um, internationally and we help to deliver the UK's industrial strategy um, around research involving um, co you know, commercial sector. And we do a lot of advocacy work to government on behalf of the region uh, where we try to influence policy and investment um, into the North and um, have recently submitted a, a large uh, bid or proposal um, to government called Connected Health North for significant investment into the North. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just to show you what I say when I, when I know this is complex and what we try and do is simplify this for you. So those are all our, some of our members and some of our thematic areas and the networks that we've created around that. And they, they come from across all those networks. Um, and, but we are situated ideally to reach into those organizations to help you find the right person at the right time and to work with all the organizations that are on the call on, on, the, on, on the session today um, so that we can navigate and, and, and draw on their expertise um, to develop collaborations. Next slide, please. And I won't go into this at all. It's just purely to show you um, the complexity of the funding systems in the UK, the procurement systems and the funding flows and how, um, you know, don't be put off by this. Um, this is what we're all here to, to support you with is to help you navigate, um, you know, knowing who to go to um, and, um, you know, how the procurement works and in, in terms of helping you plan um, your product development, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, so um, when it comes to translating research from discovery to adoption, it's also a very complex landscape and we work across this whole pathway from early phase discovery work through to implementation. And we have many partners that we work with on, on this um, and that you will hear today from, from many of these partners. Um, and, and these organizations um, we all work closely together, um, you know, around the, uh, many of them are NIHR organizations, which you'll hear about. Um, but I think the key message is that the earlier you engage with this innovation pathway from discovery through to development, evaluation, adoption, diffusion, um, and the organizations along that pathway, the higher your success rate. Um, very often people come in um, from outside the UK, and although you might have evidence, for example, from Israel um, of, of, of effectiveness and so on, um, that you, there will be evidence requirements um, within the UK and within um, within all the, our organizations that we work with. And the earlier you engage, the more that we can help you with that, um, as well as with um, you know, making sure that they address the real unmet need in, in, the, uh, in the North. Um, 
So I think, um, you know, from that very um, sort of prototyping through to co-development, evaluation in practice, um, and then adoption, we work and help navigate um, with all those organizations um, to help simplify the process for you. And um, I think that's um, coming to an end. So um, just to provide a, a sort of a, a, an overview again, I think that hopefully you'll have heard, you'll know a little bit more about the North, about the strengths that we have, um, the fact that we have um, you know systems in place to support you, and um, the NHSA is is an organisation that is is there to um, help coordinate um, some of this. And um, you know we are very keen to um, to to work with, um, with with Israel to continue our work with Israel, and um, we have some contact details um, there if anyone would like to make any contact. Um, but um, just want to say thank you very much, and I hope that was helpful. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Mandy. Very good introduction and. Um... Just to say to all of our uh, audience members that the, the Q&A is open, so and I'm monitoring that, so please, if you have questions as we go through, uh, stick them in there and uh, I will uh, put them to the, the uh, panellists as we go through. But next up, uh, we've now uh, got a conversation or talk from uh, one of our biggest uh, trusts in the, in the UK, uh, so Newcastle Hospital Trust, and I'm going to pass over not to uh, Andrew, but actually to Jonathan. Uh, who will be talking us through the priorities in Newcastle and uh, the, their way of working. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Ben, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Jonathan Brown. I'm, I'm actually just filling in for Andrea today, and I'm presenting um, today on behalf of Newcastle Hospitals. Um, next slide, in fact. Um, so um, the Newcastle Hospitals represents NHS care um, for the population in and around Newcastle in the UK. Um, of course, we're part of the larger NHS network. Um, uh, and as an example, um, the NHS network provides care to over a million patients every 36 hours. So a slightly unusual metric perhaps, but it gives an idea of the scale of patient care um, in the UK that the NHS provides. Just a few uh, interesting facts from this slide. We're part of a collaboration with 10 other hospital groups within the NHS that accounts for two thirds of all the country's research infrastructure. We as a, as a hospital group, we have about 1.7 million patient contacts a year. And I think the most important thing really is outstanding patient care is our priority. Um, and that, that's relevant to you, I think, because what drives us to collaborate with organizations is the potential to accelerate the uptake of technologies that stand to improve the quality and breadth of care we can offer. Um, next slide, please. So, so just to give you an idea, once again, I'm not going to go into detail with this slide, but everything we do, as I said, centers around our patients and their quality care, and that's why we're open to collaborations. But just to, to frame it in terms of where our engagement with industry currently um, is centered, we do around 500 clinical trials a year, and a large proportion of those are commercial. Um, but we also collaborate around aging populations, orphan diseases, renal diseases, cancer, precision medicine, um, diagnostics and, and mitochondrial disease. So we, we're a, a very specialized group of hospitals, just to give you that perspective. And then of course, in the existing COVID-19 world, we're currently assessing several diagnostic platforms through five different local platforms. Um, the, the most recent is an innovation lab um, linked to our newly formed COVID testing hub for the region. Um, so next slide, please. Um, that being said, um, I think, some areas where we're currently focusing, um, which is, I think, relevant more for, for the topic of today. Um, so clinical research, I've already highlighted, but I just want to call out that we, we, we've expanded into virtual trial capabilities. So that's a very, very um, distinct area of interest for us. And then advanced therapies. Um, we have existing advanced therapies treatments up here. We do CAR T and SKIDS diagnostics, as I've alluded to already and then digital health and digital pathology. So that's just to give a flavor of, um, of, of our interests, but also it's important to point out that we're part of a, a broader ecosystem when you collaborate with organizations. So, so the organizations below these, these respective boxes are the local organizations around Newcastle, who you could say are the facilitators in these respective areas. 
um, and they themselves are supported by organizations like AHS, and NIHR and NHSA, who are also presenting today. So, so these structures are in place to accelerate the process of collaborating. And I think it's part of a learning curve in adopting innovation that they've been putting in place. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, and really, I, I, you know, this slide is, is really just pulling out this theme. Um, once again, not to go into the detail, but just to highlight that even in the area of, of research, um, where New, Newcastle Hospitals is well established, this is, this is very much a, a joint collaboration with a, with a lot of people, but it does, a lot of groups, I should say, it does center around the Newcastle Joint Research Organization, in this case, NGRO, um, and they themselves are linked with NIHR, university research, commercial trials, and a, and a myriad of other funders. So, so there is a, an element of complexity, um, but it's there to accelerate adoption and collaboration. Um, next slide, please. So um, I think importantly, um, on the back end of that, um, this slide really is just to highlight that Newcastle is also home to an established life science sector. Um, and that's something that's been fostered and, and supported by robust government policies over the years. It's taken, taken a long time to form, but once again, these policies were, were put in place to support life science technologies. Um, and this means really that the infrastructure is present in, in Newcastle. To, to accelerate the adoption of, of new health innovations directly into the NHS. And we've had a, a learning curve and we've had a lot of collaborations over the years which have helped us to formulate um, this, this ecosystem. Um, perhaps, perhaps the next slide, thank you. Um, and this is the one that, that probably gives you just a big picture. It's, it's more complex admittedly, but, but healthcare is a complex environment. Um, and, and I think we'd be remiss not to point that out. Um, it, it's not a case of, of getting something to market immediately. There's a lot of regulatory checks and balances, but, but really we just wanna highlight that, that, that within the context of this established um, life science ecosystem um, we have access to, we can support everything from ideation right through to adoption of, of care changing health innovations. And once again, Again, just to, to point out that within the context of the Newcastle hospitals, that's the end objective. It's about creating access for our patients. So, um, you know, research proof of principles, generating real world evidence and randomized trial data for regulatory approvals. Um, all of those things are covered within this framework. And, and I think that the last slide really, I think was to, to, to try illustrate this point a little more simply. Um, this, this slide, in fact, frames a collaboration over about 18 months between the, the Newcastle um, hospitals and a, and a local SME. Um, they have a prognostic marker for a specific cancer, in fact. Um, and top left are the organizations like NHSA and AHSN are, are so critical in facilitating these types of collaborations between the NHS and an SME. And um, the NIHR facilitated funding for a lot of the early development work in this case. And in this case, it's not always, um, you know, going to happen. But in this case, the new um, the Newcastle hospitals were able to collaborate from quite an early stage. But of course, we we partner at varying stage of included proof of principle with this diagnostic assay. Um, there was even some product optimization work. Um, and then also the process um, of, of generating real world evidence and other data for submissions that were made for CEIVD and FDA filing. So, so the regulatory environment uh, around diagnostics is still forming. Um, and it's so important to have collaborative partners uh, um, to be able to generate evidence for submissions. And of course, in this case, the same data that was generated in this process for filing was, was used then for a submission to NAS. Um, so NAS is the body in the UK who assesses cost effectiveness and then advises on the adoption of technology to NHS. So the final step then of course is, is adoption and scale up. And that's the beauty of the collaboration with NHS. Having walked this journey, um, the scale up and adoption when approved can then take place within the NHS network and in the framework um, if applicable. So I think that's a, it's a bit of a whirlwind tour but I, I hope it's highlighted the fact that A, we, we are looking and able to collaborate because certainly we, we both gain um, from those collaborations um, and we look forward to, to working with you. Um, that's all from my side. 
Thanks, Jonathan. That was really helpful. And uh, so I think this is quite a, a, a general question, but uh, I think you'll be quite well placed to, to start answering it, although not get into the detail that came in during your talk was from uh, I.L. Uh, Elric, who says, uh, so their group of researchers is uh, working on a treatment against COVID based on antisense RNA. Um, and they're looking for a, a, an initial investment uh, how can they get partners and investors for their project? And I think that last slide of the uh, pipeline probably covers it quite well in the broader sense. But I wondered if you wanted to uh, maybe just add a few extra comments as I know you work in this space. Um, so certainly, Ben, I think in terms of, of, of COVID, uh, we, there's, a, there's a huge focus on the diagnostic assays and certainly that's what the Innovation Hub is, is aimed at doing. Um, but, but you know that that the principles are can be um, expanded to to all those sorts of collaborations, and in in cases like that, we would then call on the network around us um, in terms of also um, getting access to funding where applicable. So really, just you know facilitating that that you get linked up with those sources. Um, and in the case of the last slide, that was exactly what happened. Um, as part of the whole collaboration, there was a submission for funding um, to fund all the generat generation of real-world evidence. But I just want to be very clear that it's it's very much uh, about leveraging that ecosystem and those, those collaborations around us. Um, so it's not something we do in isolation, but yes, we can do that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, a really key point that runs through all of this is that um, the, the ecosystem is really strong and uh, you need uh, partners in sort of along the whole pathway and looking ahead to be able to sort of bring it all together but that's what this group can help do um, so thank you very much Jonathan I'm going to now move on to our, our next uh, NHS Trust speaker uh, Chris McKee, Dr Chris McKee from Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust another exceptionally large uh, NHS Trust in the north of England um, with a, a talk with a slightly different flavour and I'm just going to hand straight over to Chris Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Shalom, everybody. It's great to uh, to be able to speak with uh, Israeli innovators like yourselves again. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you today and tell you a bit more about uh, Leeds and our unmet needs, um, the hospitals of the future, and how uh, we can support you and your business endeavours and along your clinical journey as well. Um, just give it one second just to make sure it goes on to the next slide. Brilliant. So a quick, um, just a quick overview for yourselves about Leeds in general and a quick welcome from us here in around our city region, just so that you're aware of it. Um, so Leeds is the largest city in the county of West Yorkshire in Northern England, which lies just a bit to the south of Newcastle, who you just heard a, a speech from before. Um, we have one of the most diverse economies in all of the UK's main employment centres, and it has the fastest rate of private sector job growth in, in any of the UK cities at the moment as well, which is a, obviously a, a great statistic to share with you. Of the 16 million population in the north of the UK that was described before, uh, 2.6 million of these are actually located in Leeds, and all of these uh, people are part of our electronic healthcare record systems and accessible as a result for their, for their patient information on a collaborative basis. And of course, it's, it is more than just a city. Um, there are many, many surrounding towns and beautiful villages, um, as you can see in some of the pictures here, referred to as the Leeds City region. So thankfully, there's been a bit of an overview of the NHS in the earlier talks. It is a very, very complex um, landscape. And Jonathan did a really, really good job of just showing the complexities of that landscape, the sheer scale of operations that the NHS is involved with, even at just at the local trust level. So for reference, within the NHS UK, um, the, you have NHS England as well as multiple other groups, and within NHS England you have individual trusts, and the Leeds Teaching Hospitals is one of those trusts as well. So some, info, some interesting statistics for you. We are the second largest trust in the UK. We are actually the largest teaching hospital in Europe, at least that's what the latest statistics have shown. We have a collection of seven different hospitals with research and innovation at its core, along with multiple clinical services, and all of those are governed by a single hospital trust entity, which will govern the same group. And we also have 
a large cohort of healthcare and clinical research infrastructures covering a wide range of disciplines, including diagnostics, digital health, surgery, digital pathology, musculoskeletal disease. The list goes on. There is, is a plethora of opportunity here um, in a similar manner to, to the this, this speech that uh, Jonathan just gave. So just some key information about the, the trust within the NHS and some further points of interest without going into too much thorough detail. Um, the LTHT delivers the widest range of clinical services of any trust in the UK. The, we, there are very, very few areas that we do not cover, and therefore we are interested in most areas of clinical research and most, most healthcare problems that, that, that are out there. The only two areas we can't do at the moment are adult heart transplants and the management of severe burns. We are also one of um, only 10 hospitals in the UK that's accredited to deliver CAR-T therapies. And we also have a growing portfolio of cell and gene therapy research, which we'd be very, very keen to engage with more uh, potential collaborators in that space. In recent years, um, the message around Leeds has changed and has been referred to as something known as the Leeds way. And in a similar message, as you've already heard in earlier speeches, it really is about putting patients at the heart of everything we do. Um, and keeping innovation and research at its core to ensure the highest quality of research. Um, the, the purpose of this is to make sure everything is collaborative and fair and accountable, and that patients are always, always at the core of everything that we wish to do and improve their, their outcomes as a whole. We want to work with innovators across the board to improve um, the patient health um, benefits and also the economic wealth within the NHS as well. And, it, and to do that, we need to ensure the highest quality of care is maintained both in and out of the hospital ecosystem. And that is where we, we really want to work with um, innovators such as yourselves to help achieve that goal. So of great interest um, to you all, I'm sure, uh, within the next five years, we are actually building two brand new research hospitals. At the moment, £450 million of investment has been guaranteed with a, with a potential £350 million more to also be supplied in the, in the five years following. The idea behind these, which is definitely relevant to the purpose of this talk, is that these are defined as digital hospitals of the future. We're going to be building a world-class children's hospital and a, a state-of-the-art adults hospital, and they're both going to be located at the same site. Research and innovation must be at the heart of all of this, and it's planned to open within the next five years, and then a full site development will be uh, completed in theory by 2030. And around this, we will be building what I like to refer to as uh, an innovation village, um, a, an interesting site where companies can embed themselves and engage directly with, with NHS stakeholders and other researchers as well. So, what does this mean for you? I'm going to start to explain to you how this, this could be a benefit to your business and also how uh, what we're looking for and the kind of collaborations that we're seeking. Of course, with the new hospitals, we, we're wanting to have quite a large focus on going digital um, and working with a range of digi health and AI solutions. This could be anything from patient triaging, the improving of diagnostics using AI solutions, improvements to our services, utilization of AR and VR solutions in many different ways. And then we are also planning to building an, an innovation pop-up hub next year in which we can also improve upon um, engagement with uh, innovators across the board and allow companies such as yourselves to showcase yourselves in the UK and engage with the wider ecosystem of Leeds and surrounding areas as well. And we want to work with you now, even though the hospitals are only opening with it in five years time, we really want to start working with these solutions now, create a legacy element of everything that we do so that we can use them in all of the hospitals, not just the new ones. And we very much want to see what solutions are out there and how we can work together. So although I have focused on digital solutions in that last slide, I want to make it very, very clear that we are keen to work with all aspects of healthcare and medicine and, and anybody who has a solution um, to any of our own med needs, we are very, very keen to engage with you as a whole. And we're happy to work with anything from academics, startups, and large corporates, we're very, very keen to engage with you. For the academics on the call, um, we are very closely engaged with the University of Leeds. I, I won't be going into much detail about that today as a later speaker, Vima Punde will be going into this in much more detail. 
but as a result, we can support access to collaboration and research opportunities within the academic ecosystem uh, in, and, in and around Leeds. For SMEs and startups on the call, and I know that there will be many of you, we are here to support you on your clinical journey. Uh, we can jointly um, work together to identify and apply funding opportunities within the UK, of which we do routinely. We can connect you to leading clinical experts who are both of academic and non-academic backgrounds. And we can ensure that um, your journey across the complex landscape of the NHS is made that much easier um, and we can help help you on that journey as a whole. And of course, large we're no, you know, we're no stranger to working with large corporates. Um, we have a wide range of clinical trial facilities, patient cohorts, and um, multiple samples that are available to use. And of course, we have a very, very large electronic healthcare record system as well that could be accessed um, for joint research opportunities as well. So finally, what does this all really mean to you? And, and I've been alluding to this throughout the talk, but I really want to say that we do want to work with you as partners and, and key collaborators and support your access to that clinical expertise, the samples and the patients and the real-time data that you need. And we, we have multiple areas in which we can support projects across the board. And we have a range of different methodological expertise that we can also, also support you with, whether it's metrology-based um, input, data governance, integration of, of new systems, and of course, the very, very essential health economic pieces um, that need to be performed as part of your data generation. So I wanted to give you a very quick example here. And, and the, although this slide is slightly complex, I'm just, I'll try and focus it down here. Um, so this is something that um, we refer to as the accelerator method. And I'm using diagnostics here as an example, as um, in the North as a whole, we are very, very strong when it comes to um, diagnostics, diagnostic technology. We want to work with um, uh, industry and, um, and startups, a, a full range of opportunities here to help really get to the, um, to the end point of ensuring the benefit to our patients and to ensure an economic, an, an, an economic boost as well within our NHS. We can support you all the way through early modeling opportunities to validate your technology and to prove its cost effectiveness. And ultimately, as, as the data has been generated, we will, we will wish to disseminate and adopt the technology as a whole. And my recommendation is often that in order to adopt across the whole of the NHS, it is worth working with just a, a small number of trusts, just two or three trusts who can work with you to generate that strong clinical evidence within the NHS, and then um, essentially act as um, delivery sites for showcasing the technology for wider adoption in the NHS as a whole. Um, oh, sorry, I seem to have skipped a bit too far there. Thank you. And, and that is it, actually. I think um, I seem to have skipped a bit too far ahead there. You lost some slides, Chris. Yeah, I think a couple of slides were just missing there, sadly. But that's absolutely fine because I think at the end, at the end of the day, um, and the fi the final message with the with those slides is, is we want to work with you. Uh, we're happy to engage with with you as a whole and ensure um, that you have the have the easiest opportunity to engage engage with us here in the NHS. And that we can also provide opportunities to um, to ensure that that journey is um, is much simpler moving forward. So I regret regretfully a couple of my final slides are, have gone missing here, but I'm more than happy to engage with you after this um, after this talk and talk to you more about further opportunities and also the capability of um, landing your company within the UK if that is of interest to you and and several other. Uh, examples that we can go over uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and I think as well, again, that, I mean, fantastic talk and fantastic introduction to the sort of services that are on offer and the expertise that exists here. And part of this process is to run the, the challenge and allow um, 
the Israeli companies to to uh, put that information in and make the best connections so that we can follow up and get into the detail as we know every uh oh there they are I'll let you uh you okay that's yeah. fine I I apologize about that everyone just a couple of final slides then just to just to go back into it I think it is important to make the make the point here that that even though I focused on leads here uh, the north is very very collaborative it does engage um across the board and so, so it's not just about uh, what these can do for you, but it's about the opportunity for engaging with Northern stakeholders as a whole. Um, so you've already heard about quite a few of these groups here, um, but just to, just to highlight once again, there's a range of further support available here that we can connect you to, including the uh, Academic Health Science Networks, which has been mentioned previously. Um, they, the, this network is available across the whole of England. Um, it was established about seven years ago to help uh, to spread innovation at pace and scale throughout the NHS and the healthcare ecosystems. Um, what we find is that the, the HSNs tend to work across distinct geographies and serve the different populations of each region and, and, and different regions as a whole. So as you saw, there was one based up in, in Newcastle and we in Leeds actually work with our local HSN, which is the Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science. The Northern Health Science Alliance doesn't need any introduction from me. They've already given a great pitch to you, but we are obviously very closely engaged with them. And you'll be hear hearing a bit more about the Leeds Enterprise Partnership and how they can support companies who wish to actually embed themselves within the UK. And, uh, and of course, exactly as has already been described before, there is a range of NIHR um, infrastructures that we are also engaged with and essentially any any problem that you may have or any any collaboration you may be looking for, I'm sure that we can engage and, and seek further opportunities for you to do that. Thank you. Um, finally, just just as a, as, a, as a quick overview for yourselves. Um, in a similar manner to what was described in Newcastle before, and it is worth mentioning that all of the cities within the north of the UK have similar opportunities. Uh, we have a facility called Nexus, which is there to allow you to expand your business within the UK. So this is what the building looks like. And the key, the key element, the key element of this is it's sort of a big, wide open space. It's still currently active, and it may be a great place to land land your business moving forwards. And we have recently been engaging with quite a few Israeli innovators, and have just opened up a new office and lab space for an Israeli company that we're working with at the moment. So we do have some good experience of working and supporting Israeli innovators, of engaging further within the UK. I apologize, it's just going a little bit slow at the moment. So what this facility will allow you to conduct the research that you need to help you develop and test innovative products and services that are in your pipeline, especially those that are in earlier R&D stages. We can uh, use this space to improve your business performance, developing new techniques or technologies as, as you move along. We can de-risk investment in research and innovation as a result of um, you working with the UK as a whole, and we can improve your competitiveness and pro productivity as a whole. We can provide access to a portfolio of patented technologies as well that can also help you on, on your journey, it should it be of benefit to you. And finally, of course, as we've described before, we can assist you with all of your research and innovation funding endeavours so that we can guarantee that you that you will have the funding that you need to to move your projects forwards as a whole and i will just click through to the next slide it's very simple if you wish to collaborate with us we're happy to just go through a very simple process of emailing myself my my information is here um, all we require is for you to um typically sign a um, sign a non-disclosure agreement with us and then we're happy to broker further discussions with a range of different stakeholders and connect you up for scoping calls with multiple team leads and all the required team members to actually decide the next plans of actions, the next steps and see if a collaboration between us is possible to help you on your business journey.
Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions from you at this time. And I apologize again for losing the slides before. Um, no problem, Chris. Uh, we're all uh, in the new digital age. It's uh, not a seminar if there isn't one missing slide or one person on mute. Uh, thank you for that. It was really good. So um, there haven't been actually any questions come in during that, uh, but I'm sure people will be in touch with you uh, if they want to. And obviously, as I was saying before, uh, the aim of this health tech challenge is to, is to make those uh, uh, targeted matchmaking introductions as well for the B2B conversation. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of schedule. So what I want to suggest is that um, rather than the 10 minute comfort break, if we still come back at one four, uh, UK time 1.40, uh, Vari, can you put the Israeli time for that into the chat, please? Um, but that is in uh, 20 minutes uh, and we'll um, get back on the uh, agenda timings. And then that way, anybody who wants to join specifically for a talk will be able to uh, uh, come back in at the right time and see what they wanted to see. Um, and uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers from the, the first session and look forward to carrying this on in the second and third sessions. So. See you all in uh, approximately 20 minutes and I'll put the information into the chat box for you. Thank you, everyone.
Hi everyone, welcome back. I uh, hope you're all here. It's uh, 1.40 here and 3.40 in Israel. Uh, so we're going to crack on with our, our next speaker, uh, who is Ivana from the uh, National Institute for Health Research that we have in the UK. And she'll be explaining a bit more about what that is uh, in some top level detail as it's a pretty massive topic. But I will, without further ado, hand straight over to Ivana. Thanks, Ben. Uh, my name is Ivana Poparic. I'm a business development manager with NIHR Office for Clinical Research Infrastructure, or NOCRI. I will tell you a little bit more about the collaboration opportunities for any life sciences companies that are coming to the UK. So to start with who we are at NIHR, um, sorry, the slides are changing very slow. Oh, sorry. We need to go back. So NIHR is the largest government funding agency for clinical research in the UK. Our aim is to improve the health and wealth of the nation through the clinical research. Uh, what we do is we fund primarily universities and hospitals in the country uh, to support translational research and management of cl clinical trials uh, across the system. Uh, this uh, includes the support uh, for collaborative projects with, uh, between industry charities, our universities, other funders, and also the national healthcare system. And we work across all of the therapeutic and diagnostic uh, areas and across all of the diseases. Our total annual budget is just about one billion uh, a year. And a Primarily that money goes actually to uh, universities and hospitals based in England to fund uh, the staff and the facilities themselves to do clinical research. But we also have research programs and uh, some of them are available to our industry partners. We also uh, provide training for um, further education of the staff. And we also fund some of the services such as Genomics England. So just to give you an idea of where UK stands uh, globally, among the top five countries in the world for uh, clinical research, when it comes to industry uh, funded studies, UK is uh, currently the second. And the top five countries have retained this position over the last two years. Uh, what we have put here is all of the clinical studies that are found on clinicaltrials.gov, which is our national site for clinical research. And uh, we've included only industry funded studies. So looking at um, NIHR numbers as a whole, to give you an idea of scale of um, our operation, in the last financial year, we had over 5,000 new clinical uh, studies and more than 1,000 of them was the commercially funded trials. We have recruited uh, almost a million patients, uh, around 50,000 of those was to the commercial studies. And almost all of the NHS trusts across England are now research active, while 80% of them working with their industry partners. So what do we actually offer to uh, the industry? If you look at the MedTech and IVD uh, innovation uh, timeline, what we do is we can support you through all of the evaluation uh, stages from the care pathway uh, analysis all the way to the output reports. And we also participate in uh, the adoption uh, research. What we also do in these stages is we can connect you to the regulatory agencies such as MHRA, HRA, and also our national uh, guidance agency, NICE. And we also work with a wider healthcare system. So we work very closely and can uh, connect companies with Department of Health and Social Care, Department of International Trade, if you wanna set up a company in the UK, Office for Life Sciences and uh, other regional organizations. So if you are a bio or a pharma company, what we normally would support is anything from early phases of clinical research. So from the first in men trial, sorry, to the phase four studies. And we would uh, both fund and facilitate uh, the research uh, in experimental medicine, but also the trials to evaluate safety, efficacy, and health economics across the pathway. 
Uh, in the adoption area, we can adopt, uh, help you connect to the agencies who will help you with uh, showing the patient the economic benefit and the healthcare system impact. And again, we can connect you to the wider landscape, including the regulators and government departments. So what do we actually offer as services to the life sciences? Uh, we can provide you with access to the expertise. So clinical and scientific researchers who are uh, key opinion leaders in specific disease or technology areas. We provide access to facilities that are funded by our organization. Uh, we can also help you with uh, setting up your trial and managing it. We provide funding to industry and um, a lot of it actually uh, is uh, coming through collaboration with uh, universities and hospitals, which I will talk about a little bit more later. Uh, we can also uh, help you with access to data and samples from the patients. Uh, my colleague Theo is going to be talking a little bit later about uh, an IHR clinical research network. I would just emphasize that for the companies that already have a protocol and funding um, taken care of, uh, CRN is the quickest way to get the research study set up in the UK. So on the data provision and uh, patients and samples, we work and fund a number of organizations that can help you access those. Um, among those, we have NIHR Bioresource, which now has more than 100,000 consented patients, both from healthy population and some uh, disease areas that were selected. We have a patient engagement service that connects you directly to patient groups in disease areas. Uh, National Biosample Centers, UK Biobank, which now has more than half a million consented patients with longitudinal data from a year, um, age of 40 to 69. Uh, if you are looking at, to do some metabolomics research, we can uh, connect you with NHR Phenome Center. And also for access to data, we have a primary, secondary services and research data available through our partners. So to describe just a little bit about what kind of organizations within the UK we are funding. Uh, first is the biomedical research centers. And to simplify, these are large partnerships between hospitals and leading universities in the UK. And they work across all of the disease areas and all of the technologies at any stage of development of the uh, new uh, drug or a device. Uh, they, uh, are staffed by expert investigators that are both from uh, engineering, uh, biomedical, clinical uh, background, and they uh, can help you basically set up any type of research. For if you're a medtech or a digital company, probably the most appropriate for you are medtech in vitro diagnostic cooperatives or uh, so-called mix. We have 11 of these centers across the country and you're gonna hear from a mix in Leeds in uh, the next session. What they can do is they can help you ensure that the technology is evaluated to be uh, able to do the regulatory approval in the UK. They can help you collect the evidence needed to uh, meet those re regulatory requirements and demonstrate the economic value to the NHS. And finally, if you're a cancer-based uh, company, whether you're working on therapeutics or on a, a diagnostics device, uh, we can uh, help you work with uh, experimental cancer medicine centers. So these are uh, 18 centers that work in adult cancers and 11 in pediatrics. And they work actually from earlier stages from uh, preclinical uh, uh, research through the phase two trials. Sorry. And finally, there are clinical research facilities who help you actually deliver the research that you are planning to do. So these are uh, facilities where we have research staff funded by NIHR to do clinical trials, usually early phase and experimental medicine, but also a later phase trials in the UK. And at the end, um, if you are looking at doing a study in specific disease areas, in some of them, uh, such as respiratory, mental health, uh, dementia, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, uh, and cancer medicine, we already have uh, pre-set up large collaboratives between universities and hospitals 
that uh, are working with industry to help them deliver the studies in specific areas that are a priority in the UK. Finally, I just want to mention the funding. So NIHR can provide funding to the industry across uh, translational development and clinical evaluation. To emphasize for most of those um, funding opportunities, you need to be a company based in the UK or have a UK based collaborator, such as a hospital that is going to be leading your funding application. So just the final slide, what we can actually offer to you is first is the, the access to the world leading expertise and research management and provisions. So you can uh, gather the evidence that you need to access the market in the UK. We can help you to uh, find the collaborators and build bespoke collaborations around your research project. We can help you find the funding in the country and also we can connect you to the wider UK infrastructure. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask on the chat or you can actually email me directly. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ivana. That was brilliant. And uh, we actually had one question come in over the break, which I think is pretty ideal uh, to be put to you, actually. And I think you covered quite a bit of it, but just to um, get to the specifics. So, David, thank you for your question. And David uh, asked, uh, so they're currently um, in the midst of a clinical safety study uh, and are planning a clinical study among pregnant women at risk of preterm birth for their novel technology around the prevention of preterm birth. So I wonder if you could just obviously very briefly uh, describe the process of receiving approval for a clinical study in the north of England and who you would um, have to, who David as a con company would have to contact. So if you're looking to do, the, if you already have a protocol and you're looking to just set up that study in the facilities, uh, the best way is to uh, talk to the clinical research network and Theo Christie from uh, uh, CRN is going to talk, uh, I think, uh, in a half an hour. If you are actually looking for someone to help you about uh, to um, build a protocol and find those uh, specific patient populations. So if you're looking at preterm birth uh, due to specific indication, then uh, the best way is to contact our service so we can help you find those investigators that have access uh, to a large, um, basically women's health uh, services in the country. Brilliant. Thanks, Ivana. Uh, David, I hope that uh, started to answer your question. It's obviously a big topic and we can pick it up further as this process goes on. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, uh, Philippa Headley takar who works for the Dice Devices for Dignity, which is one of the mix that uh, Ivana described earlier. Um, and I will uh, just pass straight over to Philippa so that she can get into the detail of the services that the mix provide. Thanks, Philippa. So, hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, cool, Brilliant. jolly good. So, uh, my name's Philippa Headley Takar, um, and I'm just gonna talk for the next sort of 15 minutes a bit about what my organization does, Devices for Dignity, and some of the unmet need and areas of, uh, of interest um, and, and opportunity, which might be really, very relevant to the, to the companies on the, on the call today. So, uh, next slide, please. So, who are the, the, the med tech and in vitro diagnostic cooperatives? Um, Ivana touched on this on, on her slide. Um, we are a national network of 11, four based in the north of England. And think of us very much as almost catalyst organisations, thinking about the kind of expertise that's needed to move you along that product development journey. So from very much validating unmet need and opportunity through, as Ivana said, some of the, the product development activity, evaluation, evidence generation, and thinking about how you're going to get to market. Particularly from a device of a dignity perspective, we focus very much on that unmet need and validation of that and understanding that. Um, and it's important to get those foundations right to have more commercial success at the, at the other end. Um, we're very much thematic, so we're not in competition with each other. Um, so when you think about working with us, there's opportunity to work between the different organisations, not necessarily thinking about having to work with one in, in, in isolation. Um, and very much we're sitting in the heart of the NHS. So I'm hosted within Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, for example, and we work very closely with our, with our counterparts at the, 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 the Children's Hospital for their work in children and young people activity. Uh, next slide, please. So 
each of the medtech cooperatives have, have different themes. Um, so I've listed these on the slide here. I think um, it's very important when reaching out to these organisations to really think about their thematic focus. And when reaching out for collaboration, be very mindful of the work you're doing and the tech you're developing or where it fits within those themes. And think about the support that you're seeking along that development journey. Um, and be prepared also that if somebody, if you think you're at a, a, a technology readiness level, but someone says, well, actually, we think you need to go back a step and think about, um, think about the market, think about the work you've done to work with, with people living with some of these conditions, very much take that advice because these are the experts and they've seen a range of technology and they'll be aware of the mistakes that have made um, with companies in the past. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to focus very much on, on our organisation and our focus, which is long term conditions. So conditions with, with no cure at this time, but can be managed by, by various treatments. And we know this is a, a global issue, particularly in the UK. We're looking at over 20 million people with, with one long, long term condition. Of course, these are very broad, um, but over 10 million have, have more than one um, long term condition. And 15 percent um, of young adults are living with a long term condition. So this is very much about the full life course and the impact that has on individuals, the people that care for them, and the impact on health and care services. And we've looked at this from sometimes conditions have been looked at in isolation, which is not the best way then to think about, well, what does having that condition mean uh, in terms of everyday life? Um, so we try and think about conditions within the context of what are those challenges, what are those barriers to living with dignity and independence, hence our name, and thinking about the different environment that we use technology in. So our clinical themes are diabetes, uh, renal technology and long-term neurological conditions but we don't just think about the condition we think about well what does that mean to somebody then so what does it mean in terms of communication mobility um, social interaction um, pain um, limb function we think about it in that context and we think about different environments where technology might be used so in the home in primary care which is your, your, your gp your, your, doc, your, your doctor is it in hospitals is it in care homes um, so we try and think about different uses of different technology in different different places. We also have a number of cross cutting themes. So we think about rehabilitation technology, assistive tech and connected health. So perhaps Internet of Things within the home environment. And we also think about human factors. And that's a big theme for us in terms of um, behaviour. So sometimes technology is being developed where someone says, well, surely that's the problem and we've created this and there's your solution. But they haven't thought about culture or acceptance of using technology or people's motivations and people's behaviour. So that's a big area that we do need to think about because we know across society we're not all the same and we, and we, and we use technology in very, very different ways. So this is our kind of cube model about how we think about um, think about long-term conditions and very much the, as I said the full life course there's a lot of focus now on healthy aging and how we're moving into older age more equipped to think about self-management and, and our own health and that's an area that, that we look at as well uh, next slide please um, so when's the right time to sort of work with, with our, our organization so when we think about technology readiness levels really I think our real the best value we can bring to projects is, is in those earlier stages. So thinking about moving from a concept, early ideas and validation into that design, because we're very passionate about co-design. The best way to come up with technology for people who are supporting somebody or living with a long-term condition is going to be those people themselves. So we like to be involved at that early stage. If you come to us to work further down that TRL journey, we will be asking, well, what have you done to validate that need? What have you done to um, really understand that what you're developing is what, what people want and that, that market pull is there? Uh, next slide, please. So I've just come up with a few examples here because it also helps to think about that technology development journey and think about entry points where, where you might get involved. Um, and we know innovation isn't linear. I've tried to draw a bit of a wiggly worm here, but this is some of the um, stages on that development pathway. And this is an example looking at child limb prosthetics where we very much started at that very early stage. And this was a call where we had the funding to, to pull in those experts and start to look at where were the market challenges, market failures here. Uh, next slide, please. So this was a research call looking at uh, paediatric limb prosthetics, as I said, working with various research groups, um, had that ideation stage and thinking of early concepts, which has moved through over the past um, couple of years into a number of projects now that have got funding and are moving on to the next stage in, in, that, in that development. Uh, and they're in the space of gaming, education, 
and thinking about residual limb and, and prosthetics interface and really being aware that a child with a with a um with re requiring a prosthetic it's not the same just to go well we'll just make something smaller we have to think about culture we have to think about how a young person might feel about their, their limb and, and what they want from 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 these products so very much it's thinking about the users from day one uh, next slide please this is another example where very different, where the company came to us uh, further down that development journey, but very much seeking expertise to be wrapped around the knowledge they already had to think about how to move towards market. So this was a product in response to swallowing difficulties caused by stroke, cancer, progressive neurological conditions, where there's a risk of choking and, and chest infection, et cetera, and perhaps people are fed by a, um, a nasal feeding tube. And this was an opportunity where we worked with the company to look at getting a, um, a CE mark, um, so looking at the regulatory requirements and looking at working with our, our partners within the, the, the NIHR system to look at trial and evidence generation for this particular product, which as you can see from the image there was, was a neck uh, brace with, with electro to support that swallowing um, function. Oh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, and very quickly, so this is another example. This is the head up collar, which was again, was, was devised for people with, with neck drop because of um, uh, perhaps long-term neurological conditions. Next slide, please. Um, and where we looked at the full journey from the, the origination of, of this requirement and people weren't using collars already in place because they were uncomfortable or unappealing to wear. And we've done the full gamut of kind of support for them as an organization. Next slide, please. So we can help with a range of different things, but that's going to be bespoke to projects. So this, this could be a route to market regulatory uh, consultancy, but it's very much bespoke to the project. Next slide, please. So I just want to touch quickly on two of our key um, themes. Um, next slide, please. This is the long term neurological conditions theme. And if you look at some of the stats there, it, it pretty start reading, actually, in terms of the number of people living with a neurological condition, um, which could be acquired brain injury, stroke, uh, progressive conditions like Parkinson's, uh, MS, motor neurone disease, and the impact that it has had on people's quality of life and how they feel through surveys in terms of how it affects their life to a great or a moderate extent. Next slide, please. And these are some of the quotes we've had from, from colleagues who we've, um, who we've reached out to to understand what, what happens with people with this community. So this extends into social isolation, access to support, communication difficulties, people with, with motor neurone disease. Next slide, please. And also COVID has, of course, had a very big impact on, on this community. So there's been a impact on people's ability to reach out to specialist support, fear of going into hospital. Um, a significant number of people that are emerging from intensive care are fine. I think it's about 35 percent may have some um, functional neurological problems or increased risk of stroke. So there's going to be even more pressing need to look at this community and look at the types of digital support which is available to them. And particularly when we think about telehealth. So. Um, the accessibility of that. There's a lot of solutions out there, but are we thinking about things like communication? So if somebody's communication is impaired, do they have to have a carer set up a kit for them to communicate with their consultants? So I think this will be a space where we think about accessibility. Next slide, please. So we have, we do a lot of co-design, we do a lot of work with our communities to understand where their unmet needs sit. I've just briefly on these three slides, and we can share this with you after, is to look where some of these what if statements, what if we could do something about these problems? So I'm not starting with the tech solution, I'm starting with the unmet need. And we've broken this into health and care, daily living and well-being, travel, hobbies. Just because you're living with a long-term condition doesn't mean that you don't want to also enjoy life. You don't want to tech just to be how you interact with the health and care system. So next slide, please. So there's the, some of the daily living sort of what if, what if we could do this? What if we could support people to stay in work? What if we could look at pride and confidence about using kit? What if we could adapt and personalize activity? Next slide, please. And then also this, this well-being, thinking about travel, thinking about people, thinking about exercise and how people engage in physical activity, particularly for a neurological condition. Uh, we have a lot of work in Sheffield now looking at physical activity and how that links to sort of chronic conditions and our healthy aging strategy. Uh, next slide, please. And diabetes. So I just wanted to touch on some of the areas here we're interested in talking to people about. Next slide. I can find my notes. Um, so many people living with, with diabetes globally. These are four areas where we're particularly interested in conversations where people might have tech, low and high tech solutions to offer thinking about diabetic foot disorders um, and the impact that has uh, on mortality and, and quality of life. 
um, thinking about mental health and that that balance about how people have to continually manage their their, their health through self management techniques. And we also want to talk very much about diversity and inclusivity in the work we do. So we're very keen for people to come to different kinds of solutions. We know that we're not all the same. We've got difference in age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. We want to explore different types of diabetes support for different kinds of communities and what that would look like and include people within that kind of design process. So these are some of the areas we're particularly interested in talking to companies about. Next slide, please. Um, and so if you want to find out more, that's our website. Uh, and our Twitter handle. Um, I've rushed through some of that. I think 15 minutes went quicker than I thought. Um, but as I say, we can share further details about the, the, the granular detail of some of those unmet needs and why we'd be interested in talking to companies. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Pippa. And uh, you, uh, you were bang on, bang on time and you're still, uh, now you're slightly ahead, so you, you really nailed it. Um, so there were some questions that came through, but I see that they, they've been sort of answered as we've gone. So I think what we will do is we'll move um, move on to our next speaker, Vima Pundit, who's from the uh, Surgical MIC based in Leeds. Um, so again, a very similar organisation, but with a different focus and a different uh, city that, and environment that they work within. So I'm going to hand over to V now to continue our talk. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, my name is Vima Pundey and I look after the Surgical MIC or Surgical Meta Cooperative. And just as Pippa said in a, um, in a talk, you know, we are one of 11 and, you know, our particular theme is surgical and I'll sort of talk you through why, you know, we selected that theme. Um, but we are hosted by the Leeds Teaching Hospitals um, and uh, the University of Leeds is our partner as well. So both those organisations are more or less heavily involved in, support, in supporting us in Leeds. Next slide, please. So why surgery? Well, as is the case across the world, um, in the NHS, surgery plays a core part um, in patient care. So a lot of patients you know, go have surgery as part of their standard of care. And you can see some of the statistics around that um, for the NHS. And our, our particular theme focus within surgery is on the areas of general surgery, which generate the most surgical activities. Um, in the NHS. So it might be slightly different in, um, in Israel, but certainly in the United Kingdom, um, colorectal vascular and HPV, which um, is your liver, pancreas, gallbladder, um, that accounts for most of our surgical procedures. So that's where we decided to focus on. Um, and also some of the um, conditions are interlinked. So, you know, if colorectal cancer, for example, tends to spread towards the liver, so it makes sense for us to work within that area as well. And you will, we will find certain technologies are interchangeable between those particular um, themes. We also have vascular in there because vascular also includes skin. It includes wound care um, and all of those lend themselves to the surgical aspect of it. So we're mainly interested in those particular themes. Um, we do have a growing interest for neurosurgery. And we're looking at adding neurosurgery into our particular themes, um, hopefully for next year. Next slide, please. Um, so this just briefly looking at the surgical pathway. So when we're looking at technologies, um, digital health or artificial intelligence for surgery, this is what we're interested in. So we're looking at anything that can be used, um, admission, pre-admission, anything that can be used within theaters or anything that can be used as part of the patient recovery. Um, so that's what typically we're interested in. So don't feel that just because your particular technology focuses on the theater itself, that that's all we're interested in. As long as it falls within the world of surgery or surgeons have got to consider it um, as part of their clinical care, then we are very much interested in that. Next slide, please. So in terms of our clinical themes, um, I mean, we've put a few examples of some of the areas that we're interested in here, um, but this is not an exhaustive list. Um, so if your particular technology sort of area is not listed under one of those headings, then that does not mean we are not interested. Um, still do talk to us, but this just shows um, that where we've got most of the expertise within the Leeds network. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we're supported by the University of Leeds and they're the ones that provide support for our academic work stream. So what most of the mix will have is obviously the clinical focus, um, which is what is important to us. And then we also have the academic work streams and the academic work streams is where the um, universities provide support that 
clinically is not widely available. So we've got physics and engineering, and that includes your nanotechnology, robotics, mechanical engineering, biosensing, um, you know, micro bubbles. So this is where we are able to support companies with prototyping, for example, or if people need academic input or needed validating academically, these guys will be able to do it um, for us. We're also supported by health economics and clinical trials. So our health economics unit um, in Leeds um, is well known for providing um, expertise in terms of surgical innovation. So that is where, you know, they really know their stuff and they can provide early health economics modeling. Um, and they can also um, support you in terms of late phase clinical activity when we're looking at cost effectiveness and um, cost benefit analyses. Similar to the clinical trials, um, clinical trials, I know for us tend to come in towards the end of the process. So if you're looking at late phase clinical evaluations as well, these are the guys to involve. They know how to write a protocol. They know what the NIHR wants to see on application forms. Um, and they know how to ask the right questions to make sure that we're getting the clinical outcomes that the NHS is interested in. We have pathology because pathology obviously is a main feature in terms of the diagnosis of cancer. Um, so, and we also supported in leads by um, the NPIC um, that Chris McKee mentioned. So they look at digital pathology and um, leads, if, if I remember correctly, is probably the only trust that's got a fully digital pathology unit. Um, so they can process a lot of samples and they can also provide access to a lot of samples if you need that work done as well. And finally, we have the business development and commercialization. So this is where um, we try and um, make sure that the technologies that come to us are suitable for adoption in the NHS. Quite often, what we tend to get is um, companies that come to us with a completely finished product and it is very difficult at that point to tailor it to what the NHS requires. So what the business development and commercialization part um, of the university does is it helps us to work out which is, is your reimbursement model, the one that you have in your, in your business plans, is that in line with what the NHS would expect? Um, you know, is the hospital the right place for your technology or is your technology best suited to primary care? Or is it a technology that's completely customer facing and has nothing to do with the hospitals? So those are the questions we can help you answer. And just as Pippa said in the talk before, we can add more value if people come to us right at the beginning of the development phase, because that means everything is done um, with a pathway to get it into the NHS rather than trying to figure out how we get it into the NHS later on. That's much more difficult. Next slide, please. Um, so the way we work or the mix work is um, we prioritize um, our work based on unmet needs. So every single MIC um, prioritizes certain clinical unmet needs, which is what the NHS has said, this is at the top of our list. If you give us a technology in this area, then you know we're singing, we're home dry. This is the best thing that could happen to the NHS. So that's part of our remit as well. So our particular unmet needs in surgery are the ones that you can see on the screen. Um, and they're not exhaustive, but they do cover a wide range of things. So when we are looking and working with companies, we try and make sure that, um, thanks Ben, we try and make sure that we can cover, um, we're covering one of those unmet needs because there's no point in working on a technology um, that the NHS is not interested in or one which they think is a nice to have. So we want the must haves, um, not the nice to haves. Next slide, please. So how do we support industry? Um, so we help in terms of developing collaborations. You need an academic partner. Um, we can certainly provide those. Um, if you're looking for patient and public involvement, which the NIHR is absolutely big on, um, you know, we can set up patient focus groups. We can set up clin um, clinician focus groups, even academic focus groups, so that you can understand exactly what the needs are. We also have mobility access to mobility and placement funding. So if you'd like to spend um, some time with our academics or clinicians for four weeks, six weeks, two weeks, then we can arrange to get some funding for you, which means you can spend some time here and actually understand the environment as they're working in it. Um, we're one of the few mix that has got funding to support proof of concept. Um, so we've got a very small pot and the details are on our website. But once again, I think the thing to be mindful of is it's got to meet an unmet need. So we can fund relevant proof of concept studies. And finally, um, once we, for some of the studies that we fund at this stage, um, 
we can also become co-collaborators on larger um, grant funding collaborations such as Innovate UK, um, which do require either a clinical component or patient and public involvement component, and we can lend our weight to that. And we've got loads of examples where we've been able to leverage additional funding for companies based on our involvement. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just quickly highlighting sort of how, how we work. Um, so it's basically, if you're developing a technology, you can either come to us first of all to validate your unmet need, or we can look at whether your idea has got translational potential or whether it can actually be transferred into another clinical area. So that's one of the things we do as well. We won't let you go down a path that's not going to work. If you come to us with something for colorectal and we we let you know that it's probably more ideal for liver, then that's something obviously as a company you need to think about. But from our end, that's the bit that will work in the NHS. That's what that advice means. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned before, grant funding applications, those colored little boxes is what the NIHR is looking for in its funding streams. So as I mentioned, in terms of clinical need, patient and public involvement, regulatory um, value for money, um, and sometimes NHS adoption plans, we can support you with those particular areas um, of a funding application. Next slide, please. And that's just to show, similar to Ivana's slide, um, just all the funding streams we sort of get involved in at some point. Next slide, please. And just to quickly finish off with two examples, um, we had one company that came to us with this particular technology. So this is artificial intelligence. Um, you know, we asked them a problem they're trying to solve, and this was validated by the surgeons. You know, what's the actual unmet need? Um, and that's highlighting the problem. Um, that the surgeons have um, in theater. So they actually came with one, um, one particular aspect to that technology and we managed to direct them in another way that the hospitals were actually more inclined to go down. And in terms of patient benefits, no one can dispute those patient benefits. So we've managed to secure Innovate UK funding twice for this particular company. And we're actually on our third application now. So this particular collaboration is a very good example of our involvement um, in your technology development. Next slide, please. I think it's stuck on my end. Oh, there we go. Um, developing a non-invasive skin contact medical device. Um, so that's the actual device, a problem they're trying to solve. Um, and after talking to our clinicians, um, they highlighted the unmet clinical needs that they had. And um, what we're doing now with our particular company is actually working on validating that. Um, in, um, in lab models before they can move it out to first, first in patient or first in man studies. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and that's it. And if you are interested or have got loads of questions that are related to surgery, then that is our generic email address. If you send an email to that address, you will definitely be replied to. Um, it's not a dead email. We do monitor it daily. Um, and thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you, V. Um, so there aren't any uh, questions in the Q&A, but I do keep them. A couple have been coming in that we've been answering as uh, we go. And I also want to remind everybody, I'll be putting the link in the chat, but uh, as part of the Health Tech Challenge, we've made the and an expression of interest form available. If you fill that in, then uh, we at the NHSA will be doing some matchmaking service to help direct you to the most relevant person as you go, although you can, of course, um, get in touch via the emails and uh, also recommend on that form who you would like who you think is most relevant for you. So I'll uh, pop that link in there so that everybody can get a good look at that. Uh, and then without uh, any more delay, I'll uh, pass over to Theo, who's gonna be talking about the clinical research network that Ivana mentioned earlier on. Thanks very much, Ben, and uh, good afternoon, everyone that's joining us from Israel and anyone else anywhere in the world. Um, it's great to be part of this um, fantastic presentation today. And there've been lots of really good talks earlier today, which has done a lot of my job for me in terms of setting the scene. So. What it allows me to do is just talk about the, the clinical research network. So what I would like you to get out of this is to learn a little bit about what the clinical research network does, who we are, and I suppose ultimately how we can, how we can support your clinical research endeavors. And if you're interested in doing research in the UK, how we can work together to support that. So I know in some previous, um, previous presentations, we have talked a little bit about the NHS. Um, the NHS is obviously a, a huge uh, USP for the UK in terms of conducting clinical research. 
I'm not going to go into too much detail about the NHS. Obviously, it was founded in 1948 and providing free care at the point of access for the entirety of the UK, and that's still very much true as of today. Um, okay, here we go. Um, I suppose maybe some, some lesser known facts about the NHS are, and the point I really want to make is to stress the, the kind of scale and the size of, of the organisation. It actually is the, the fifth largest employer um, in the world. It employs around 1.7 million people. And the reason it needs such a huge um, staffing is because the population of the UK, although we're quite a small um, island and a couple of islands, um, we do have a we are very densely populated and have a, a large diverse population. So these we have a population of around 66 million. So what we're looking at every 24 hours is the NHS treating about 1.4 million patients. So that's a huge amount of work, huge amount of treatment carried out on a daily basis by a huge amount of people across the UK. Um, and I suppose the key point about this is in terms of procurement, because with treating so many patients so, so regularly, it means the NHS is a huge purchaser and user of, of medicines and diagnostic tools and uh, technologies. Um, and the estimated budget for 2021 is, is just shy of 130 billion pounds with a considerable chunk of this going towards procurement. So as a couple of people previously, Ivana nicely uh, led me into this, um, the Clinical Research Network is one part of the wider National Institute for Health Research. As the name suggests, where we sit on the kind of organogram is we operate at that, um, the delivery side. So we're very much uh, clinical. So we're working with, with companies who are conducting research at the clinical stage. So anything really from first in patient right through to, to phase four post-marketing research. We support all types of research, as you can see there around the outside of the uh, of England and the, the map of the British Isles. You can see all the different therapy areas that we support. These are just the the kind of the top level therapy areas that we split our portfolio, but we obviously have lots that fall within these. Um, so we support all types of research within these areas, but also not just within therapeutics, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, diagnostics, devices, digital applications. We're also working with um, SMEs and startups. So contract research organizations as well and also any 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 company really so it doesn't have to be a, um, a kind of pharmaceutical or a technology a biotech company it could be any type of company in the world that is considering running some kind of research in the UK and who we are is we have national coordinating offices and we also have 15 local clinical research networks across the country and these map against the AHSNs as previously um, identified so the reason that we operate in these 15 different local CRNs is that we have um, these different regions have the expertise, they know their patient populations, they know their kind of the how to reach into the community, they know their standard of care, they have good relationships with their research sites, they know, they know uh, PIs, they know who to go to to propose research trials to. They also have control of their own budget so they can prioritise research depending on the need all that area essentially they, they are our experts on the ground across the whole of the country and it allows us to have full coverage of of england and what we also have within these is um we have clinicians so we have specialty groups as i mentioned they're on the outside so i noticed uh, previously someone had mentioned in the chat around an eye care trial so we have an ophthalmology specialty group we have a representative uh, clinical specialty group for ophthalmology made up of clinicians and investigators from across the 15 different regions forming a national panel of experts within ophthalmology. And the same is true for the rest of the, the other 29 groups that we split our portfolio into. So this is, I suppose, the really important bit. So this is specifically how can the clinical research network work with you? So first and foremost, we offer a, a series of completely free of charge with the exception of one service, but all of them except for one is free of charge services we offer. So First one really quite straightforward. If you're looking to speak with a clinician to discuss a, a study proposal, you can come to us. We can identify the, the right person depending on the disease area you're looking at. As I mentioned, we have these 30 different specialty groups, so we work very closely with them. We can connect you to one of these KOLs. I mentioned there's one service that isn't free. This is this one. It's the patient feedback service. We This is a, a non-profit service that we offer to industry. The only reason we charge for it is because we incur costs such as um, paying for patients' time, travel, uh, reimbursing for uh, refreshments, things like that. So 
but essentially what we're offering is um, uh, there's, there's no other national framework for this, but it's a service in which we facilitate the meeting of a patient advocacy group with the company to discuss their clinical trial ideas. It might be to review patient information sheets or the study documentation prior to ethics submission. It might just be you want to get in a room with a series of um, patients who suffer from a chronic condition and you want to ask them how they live with their condition and what might make them more inclined to take part in the research. And the idea is for it to be very patient centric and and for companies to develop their protocol based on the needs of patients. So similarly to the patient feedback, what we also offer, and this is now back to our free services, is our, a protocol review. So this is exactly as the name suggests, what we do is circulate your study synopsis or your draft protocol to our clinical specialty group. Again, I'm gonna use the ophthalmology example. So we will share your synopsis or draft protocol with our ophthalmology specialty group. It will go to 15 ophthalmologists around the country. And what we try to get is two or three uh, two or three of those to complete a feasibility questionnaire, looking at the study deliverability, the compatibility with UK standard of practice, things like that. Will the study work? Will investigators be interested? Will patients be interested? And will they be able to recruit onto the trial? As we kind of shifted up a bit, we're looking at some site specific services. So this is site level feasibility. This is a UK wide service, again, completely free of charge. We do this within two to three weeks. What we do is we identify suitable research centres and PIs across the whole of the UK within two to three weeks to take part in your trial. Any interested centres, we get them to complete a feasibility questionnaire looking at capacity, capability, uh, predicted setup times, predicted patient numbers, uh, predicted uh, recruitment strategies, things like that, an idea about capacity, so how many ongoing trials they have um, and, and things like that about previous performance to give you an idea about their pedigree as well. Once you've selected your sites, we will work to support you through the setup phase. So we, we um, the NHS has mandated the use of um, an unmodified MCTA, so to, to speed setup. We've also developed something called an industry costing tool, which is a, an online platform which, with, a, with a costing element. So it's a transparent, streamlined way you can cost out your clinical trial. Very much a case of a, a do once and share model. So if you have 10 clinical research sites, you need to fill this platform in once it gets reviewed nationally and then sent out to the 10 centres to agree any local variants. It's very transparent, like I say, it's very streamlined and it's there to expedite your costing and contract mm -hmm. negotiations to get you set up as quickly as possible. And then obviously, if you having if you have any delays at the site level, we're, uh, we're the, the people on the ground to help with that. So it might be that you need the PIs to, to have a bit of a nudge if you're waiting for something back from them, a CV, some, some signing, some equipment certifying, for example. We're, on, we're, we're there to, to get things back on track and to get those centres greenlit. And then obviously very importantly is the, the delivery. So once you've got the centres open and you're recruiting a set number of patients within a set period of time, we have performance teams both locally, so looking at a site-by-site -site performance level and also at a study-wide basis who are looking from a national level to track performance um, and spot whether if recruitment falls behind schedule and then come up with ways in which to identify those barriers and come up with solutions to get things back on track and to get you recruiting to time and to target. So that's kind of the services we offer. I just want to try to put that into context by uh, giving you a, a brief case study from a, a UK SME called Helam. So this is a, the, a digital a digital company who had developed a digital solution uh, with, with two different parts to it. One of them was um, an online software to be used by primary care, so for by general practitioners, which was then linked into a mobile app used by patients, and they could get this on their, any of their smart devices, iPads, phones, or whatever. And they were developing this technology. There was a number of different um, indications they, they could go into. We supported them and still are supporting them with their, with their pilot study, which they chose to do within diabetes, because obviously within primary care, there's a, a, a huge population across the UK that are receiving treatment for their condition within primary care. So it was a, a, a good way for them to test uh, the, the, their technology. So what did we do? Just bouncing back to the previous slide in terms of services, we reviewed their protocol synopsis. We had a look at it. We assessed it. We had our diabetologists and primary care experts assess whether it was feasible. We then also ran our site level feasibility. They were looking for about 20 research centres and then tried to speak to a few themselves before contacting us and hadn't had much success. After about two weeks, we'd identified around 117 different primary care centres that were keen to take part in their trial or at least find out more and provided feasibility questionnaires for them to provide them with extra information. What we also did, as I mentioned, 
They used the costing tool, so we got their costing done nice and quickly and also supported them. So they whittled down 117 to about 20 sites, uh, helped them choose the best ones, helped them with SIVs, things like that. And they're supporting them now to get to get greenlit. Has taken a little bit of a, a delay during COVID uh, because of the timing of that, but we're working closely with them in those 20 research centres to get them set to get them set up and recruiting. But that just gives you a nice idea uh, about an example of the services that are available to you. So Ivana previously talked about some statistics. What I wanted to show you is some statistics that the Clinical Research Network has been working on specifically within commercial medtech trials in the last financial year. So we supported, we saw 60 new trials come onto our portfolio. Um, that, that totaled, uh, along with previous studies open, 203 open medtech trials that we were supporting the delivery of across the country. And in total, those 203 trials recruited just shy of 9,000 patients. So a phenomenal number into medtech. And it's roughly about 10% in terms of medtech to pharma in terms of the numbers that we're seeing and we're supporting. So again, Ivana briefly mentioned on this, but I suppose just to differentiate where the CRM, because I know it's quite confusing who, who to come to and, and who's best placed. So the point in which the clinical research network would be able to support you as a life sciences company, uh, regardless of the type of company is, do you have a research question? Is the study funded already? And do you have some kind of a synopsis, a worksheet, a draft protocol? If you are yes to all of these, then we are the, the people for you and we can speak with you. And, and what I like to do is to develop a bit of a, a custom fit set of services that meets your need to make sure that you're getting the most out of what we can offer you. Just also quickly wanted to touch upon the work we've been doing this year. It's obviously been very busy with, with COVID-19. So we've been working across uh, multi-stakeholders such as the regulators, the MHRA, the HRA, and um, funders, the UK uh, Research Innovation, um, to support COVID research, setting up an urgent public health process to provide a national priority status for a number of studies coming through. So we had around a thousand applications for therapeutics, diag diagnostics, vaccines um, for, for COVID-19, and we've approved around 68, so given them national national priority, which meant that they were received expedited services. They were set up within a matter of days rather than the standard number of months that you might find. And um, we also part funded with UKRI um, a program of around 20 million pounds to go into COVID-19 research. Um, of those 68 trials that we have prioritized, we have seen just over 230,000 patients treated on COVID trials that we have supported. So again, phenomenal number and we're continuing to work within this area specifically moving into the vaccines now um, and we have a registry set up for that's got around 300,000 volunteers who are keen to take part in research and have provided consent to be contacted by investigators. So my final thing I wanted to mention um, I wasn't sure if this was picked up earlier there was a presentation at the start by uh, Newcastle um, and they have one of these uh, patient recruitment centres so this was something that was born out of the industrial strategy second sector deal. So it was um, government um, plan to really improve the, the way in which clinical research was delivered within the UK and very much to, to promote the UK as a clinical trial destination. So what one of the things was the patient recruitment centres. There was a, a long process last year of, of identifying these. Every, pretty much every single trust in the country wanted to have this as a status because they're pump primed with money. Essentially, we had the five you can see here, Newcastle, Blackpool, Bradford, Leicester and Devon, a nice spread of the country. And they have now been selected and named as patient recruitment centres and are now set up to take part. And what they are, in theory, is um, centres of excellence for later phase research. So all of them will have a previous pedigree of performance. All of them will have close links into the community to act as have different recruitment models to be able to reach those hard to reach populations. So Close, um, close connections with primary care and um, tertiary care and community care, especially to really act to, you know, using hub and spoke models to find patients and then to bring them into their patient recruitment centres. The five of the five of the centres have agreed things like shared working, shared SOPs, shared costing, shared um, contracting. So the idea is if you were to open a trial at all five of these or a number of these, it would be almost like dealing with one because it was made a lot easier because they're in agreement in a number of different ways. They're also able to, like I say, they set up quicker because of these reasons and also able to, in theory, deliver more patients because of those workings with the community and, and that funnel through um, that way as well. 
a big part of what they're there for as well from a patient centric point of view is to really prioritize customer service so they're really looking to improve patient recruitment and especially retention so they want to get patients to come back and remain on studies and actually take part in, in future studies by actually thinking about the patient's needs very much from a customer service point of view so they've all adopted a kind of concierge style of service they've got things like um, free parking for patients taking part in the trials very much trying to put them first and the, the, um, it was touched upon earlier in, in, in the Newcastle talk about uh, the focus shifting towards decentralization of trials and that's very much something that the the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated in the UK is the move into how can we do how can we conduct research smarter and it's that kind of decentralized and hybrid and virtual trial methodology that we're seeing more of and these centers will be utilizing this kind of methodology really like I keep saying to take part in more later phase research to get set up quicker and to deliver more patients so I think in a whistle stop tour that was all I was going to say I'm pretty sure I'm within time so I'm happy to answer any questions essentially uh, the Clinical Research Network is here to support your, your needs. We have a number of different free of charge and one not so free of charge services that we can support you with. It's a case of getting in touch, discussing your proposal and seeing who's best placed. And it's also worth mentioning as well that all the different bodies that have been on these different um, presentations today, we all work very closely with each other. So it might be that, you know, we have an initial conversation, but it actually turns out you're better suited to, to V at the surgical MIC or actually to put you in touch with Ivana or, you know, directly to one of the, the trusts or the, uh, the NHSA directly. So it doesn't really matter who you come to. We, we will sort you out in the end, I suppose, as a worst case scenario. But um, that, was, that was all I wanted to trouble you with today. So thank you very much for listening. I um, appreciate your time. Brilliant. Thanks, Theo. It was uh, perfect. And we've actually managed to get ahead of schedule uh, again, which I think is always nice. So uh, I'm going to once again extend our comfort break. So we come back at the, the time that is in the agenda. So that's uh, 2.50 in the UK and uh, 4.50 in Israel. Uh, so thank you very much to the, uh, the Israeli side for still being with us this afternoon. And uh, uh, I know we'll be going and grabbing a, a quick cup of tea and, or coffee or something. And I hope you get something as well and see you all in uh, 20 minutes for our last two speakers who are focusing more on the uh, market access and business support side of things. So we have a speaker from the HSN network who will dive into um, how uh, to think about actually accessing the market once you have your uh, sort of you've gone through that evaluation process with, for example, Theo and the CRNs and a conversation with uh, Elaine from DIT who are talking about the sort of wider business support and setting up a business in the UK and things like that that you might need to consider. So I'll uh, see you all in uh, about 20 minutes and thank you very much, Theo.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I uh, hope you made it back with us, and thank you uh, for uh, you know. I appreciate the it's uh, our late afternoon in Israel, um, but we've got two really good speakers. Well, three really good speakers lined up for you. So this next talk is going to be uh, kicked off by Lindsay from the uh, Innovation Agency, and she'll explain what that organisation is and does in a minute, uh, and then passed over to Kevin from the same organisation to talk about his role there. So uh, I'll pass straight over to you now, Lindsay. Thank you. That's brilliant, Ben. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the NHSA and to the UK Israel Tech Hub for this opportunity to present to you this afternoon. We're, de we're delighted to be here. So um, as Ben says, I'm Lindsay Sharples. I'm the Associate Director for Partnerships at the Innovation Agency. And we are part of a network which is the innovation arm of the NHS. And you've already heard lots this afternoon about how complicated the NHS is. Uh, so I'm only going to tell you a tiny bit about us as an organisation. Um, just let me make sure I've got control here. I do have control apparently. Okay, here we go. Yes, so I'm only going to tell you a little bit about us uh, and where we fit in, but together with my colleague Kevin Morton, who is our head of international programmes, we're going to tell you how we can help you to sell your product to the NHS. Um, you can see our main funders here, the majority of our uh, money comes from the NHS directly, but we also have some money from Europe and I'm going to return to tell you a little bit about the EIT health opportunity a little bit later. So the region that we work across is the northwest coast of England. Um, as I said, we're part of a network that covers the whole country so that if we're successful um, introducing an innovation into the northwest coast, we have a mechanism to get that innovation spread across the whole of the country. Uh, the main city in our region is Liverpool, which I'm sure you know is famous for the Beatles and for football. But what possibly you don't know is that because of Liverpool's port and maritime history, um, the city is home to five specialist uh, or tertiary trusts, as we call them, um, within all, all within a few miles of one another. So we have Liverpool Women's, we have Liverpool Heart and Chest, we have the Clatterbridge Cancer Centre, we have Walton Neuro and Older Hay Children's, which is the largest children's hospital in Europe. And the reason I mention these hospital trusts is because I'm sure you know, um, that actually the specialist hospitals are more likely to successfully innovate and a large part of that is because of their specialism but also because they are more likely to have um, senior staff leading uh, this um, innovation function. So our role is to connect and uh, transform healthcare um, through the, the adoption of innovation. We connect and support startups with relevant clinical teams locally, regionally and nationally. Uh, we can connect you with um, key opinion leaders, decision makers and influencers. But importantly and critically for me, we can help you prepare for these collaborations. We can help you to understand the culture in the NHS, which is difficult and we can help you to be the best possible version of yourself and your business. So in terms of our offer, we offer a bespoke and tailored service, if you like, to the needs of your company. And these are some of the things that we offer and Kevin's going to elaborate on the detail of these shortly. But in terms of the way we've been working, we've worked with startups, um, and small and medium sized businesses since 2013, um, as well as corporates and big pharma. Um, and over the last three to four years, we've been developing and refining our offer to international businesses. And these are some examples of the companies that we've been working with. I mean, we've said that in the past, but we don't 
tend to lose companies, we carry on working with them really. So the, these are all, as I say, currently in our portfolio. We are embedded in the NHS, but we also connect to a range of other partners. Um, and these are just a, a few examples of organisations that add value to what, what we can offer. Um, of course, they're selected based on the needs of the business, your business, and of course, the relevance of what these organisations are trying to achieve. waiting for it to move on sorry a little bit of a delay um what i want to do yes is to briefly outline some funding opportunities that are um, available to you i mentioned eit health at the beginning of my presentation and this is a european network that we are a, a member of um, and actually were a very um, active participant in a couple of their programs, um, uh, Bridgehead Europe and Bridgehead Global. Um, yeah, there they, there they are. Um, so Bridgehead Europe is for, uh, provides funding for companies that want to internationalize uh, within Europe. Um, Bridgehead Global is for companies that want to internationalize uh, outside of Europe and actually we're partnering with the Association of British Health Tech Industries to help uh, companies, whoops, <laughs> thank you, uh, to access the US market uh, via Texas. Um, so, and actually in Israeli companies are now eligible to apply for this funding to work with us and to help us develop and kickstart our collaboration. So I would urge you to Google EIT Health Bridgehead um, and apply and see the funding that's available to you. It is, a, it is a competitive process. We are already working with an Israeli company. So I think that's a great opportunity for us to start working together. Uh, the calls open early in the new year, so please do have a look. So I'd like to hand over to Kevin now to give you some more detail about our service offer and the way that we can work to support you to sell into the UK. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, it's good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be given this opportunity to um, talk briefly about how the Innovation Agency can assist you as you seek to access the UK market. Uh, it's been great to hear so many of the previous speakers reference the work of the academic health science networks. Um, so hopefully um, you'll be a little bit familiar now with some of the work that we do. Um, by way of an introduction, um, my name is Kevin Morton. Uh, as Lindsay said, I'm a program manager at the in the commercial team at the Innovation Agency. My role is specifically to support our non-UK companies who are seeking to try and access the UK health market. Um, I mentioned the Academic Health Science Network. I've, I'm, I'm quite lucky in that I've, I've come to the Innovation Agency, but I've also had some previous experience working in one of our neighbouring Academic Health Science Networks, uh, Health Innovation Manchester. So I've um, got a good deal of experience of supporting companies as they seek to try and access the UK market. So, um, as an academic health science network, we recognise the direct correlation between economic prosperity and population health. So we remain committed to supporting businesses who can assist us with this agenda. Could you... Thank you. So the Innovation Agency has a dedicated commercial team who works specifically to connect businesses with healthcare. Our team work across specific geographic regions in the northwest of England to support innovative businesses as they seek to develop products for the healthcare market. In addition to this, the Innovation Agency is an established member, as Lindsay said, of the EIT network of accelerator sites, providing European startups and scale-ups with bespoke support, 
bespoke support, sorry, to enable them to grow out of their domestic markets into the healthcare market of the UK. Since 2017, our team have assisted approximately 30 international businesses as they seek to bring their products and services into the UK market. So how can we help? Well, the Innovation Agency is an NHS organisation with a mandated remit to operate as the key innovation arm of the NHS. We exist to help spread innovation at pace and scale, improving health outcomes and contribute contributing to the economic growth of our region. Each AS, AHSN works across a distinct geography and the Innovation Agency works collaboratively with healthcare providers for the benefit of our 4 million residents. Our footprint, as Lindsay alluded to, includes 21 NHS providers, 18 clinical commissioning groups, nine universities, and a large number of life science, industry partners, and small to medium-sized businesses. However, as we are part of the AHSN network, we are in a unique position to be able to work with our AHSN partners to help disseminate proven products and services across the country. In the support we offer to international businesses, we reach out beyond our geographical boundaries, facilitating introductions to key opinion leaders wherever they may be in the country. We'll work with companies to help them find key opinion leaders from across the NHS system to help them access the expertise and networks vital to their success. So we're able to work with businesses at all stages of product development to, to agree on a bespoke set of support packages aimed at helping them to translate their offer to the UK market. Our support packages seek to offer support relevant to the technology readiness level that you are currently at. So in terms of concept testing, the HSMs aim to improve the process of developing and adopting innovations in healthcare and can help with many stages of the development pathway. As part of the HSM network, the Innovation Agency is ideally placed to assist at this concept testing stage. At this stage, it's important to consider whether technology or service will address an unmet need in the NHS and with patients. This will help to inform the business case and the value proposition development. We are able to identify and engage with key opinion leaders and patient groups to help with the testing of early stage concepts. It's also crucial to establish whether the NHS is likely to be interested in purchasing the new technology or service based on cost effectiveness, and we can help you with this. We can work with companies to understand current NHS treatment pathways and treatment standards with a view to designing trials to generate credible UK evidence. Patient involvement in research and development is increasingly a priority for regulators and other official bodies. We are uniquely placed to facilitate introductions to patient advocacy groups and charities in the region and across the country. The Innovation Agency is also skilled in identifying funding opportunities and will work with businesses to seek financial support. The expertise extends to helping companies who are early stages investment. I'm going to try and whiz through these as quickly as I can because I've been hurried along. Product development is an iterative process, so prototypes may be validated in confirmation studies and refined until the final product is ready to be taken through to market. We can work with product managers to ensure that solutions are developed to address the specific unmet needs of the NHS and patients involving end users in the development process. We can help you engage with regulatory bodies in the UK to ensure products meet the required standards of regulation. And our support will enable you to design clinical trials to ensure that the level of evidence gathered is sufficient to improve to prove safety, performance and cost effectiveness for the NHS. We can assist by helping companies to engage with regulators and research stakeholders to assess whether trials will satisfy requirements and support the value proposition of your product. In terms of reg regulation, in the EU, manufacturers and developers of, man of medical and diagnostic devices must demonstrate that they can conform to the requirements outlined in the rele relevant European directive before the product can be freely marketed in Europe. The CE mark being the key indicator of a product's compliance with EU legislation. The Innovation Agency can provide assistance in identifying the requirements and assessment 
and the assessment process, sorry, to ensure conform confirmation to EU standards. We have a track record of supporting companies to engage with the medicines and healthcare re products regulatory agency as they prepare to bring products and services to the UK market. In terms of reimbursement, introducing new technologies and services to the NHS has always been challenging. In order to understand the UK reimbursement opportunities, it's essential to be able to identify the key decision makers and budget holders. We can help you to identify the budget holders for your product, whether that be at national or local level. We can help you to understand the UK healthcare system and to engage with decision makers and influencers. The National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, NICE, is the most important organisation in England when it comes to introducing new technologies into the health system. We are able to help you prepare for NICE appraisal, identifying the relevant route for assessment and ensuring your technology is backed with the required evidence on impact and cost effectiveness. The Innovation Agency is well equipped to help you understand the NHS reimbursement system, helping you to navigate the world of procedure codes and tariffs. We have access to NHS data sets that will help you to understand current levels of relevant activity and reimbursement, which will help you to inform your case for adoption. The NHS, now more than ever, is under considerable financial pressure. It's crucial to be able to understand how you can demonstrate value to the NHS. The NHS reimbursement system is both complicated and flawed, but companies need to understand how they can operate within it, and we'll seek to help you with that. The Innovation Agency can help to make connections with key stakeholders in the system to develop the best possible evidence for reimbursement and build the business case for adoption. Quickly now, um, in terms of commissioning and adoption, the NHS is notoriously slow to adopt new, tech, new innovative products and services. There is an over, overly supply driven and top down approach to innovation. The Innovation Agency seeks to assist companies to overcome this by helping them to adopt a collaborative approach to product development. We can assist companies to help them, to help them ensure that their product meets a defined unmet need by engaging with our clinical networks, both regionally and nationally. The NHS is often not well equipped to assess real world innovations. However, the, N the HSN network is now actively supporting companies to conduct evaluations in real world settings. The Innovation Agency can help companies to identify appropriate centres to test and validate their products, helping them to increase the likelihood of commissioning and adoption. We actively work with companies to understand the complexities of NHS commissioning and procurement, helping them to engage with procurement personnel at various stages of product development. We'll help businesses understand initiatives such as the Accelerated Access Collaborative, which aims to remove the barriers and accelerate the introduction of groundbreaking new treatments and diagnostics. As a whole, the AHSN network is actively involved in a range of initiatives aimed at bringing about system transformation, improving patient safety, supporting innovation and delivering economic growth. We're well equipped and motivated to support businesses with products and services capable of assisting with the delivery of these initiatives. Thank you for your time. Sorry if I whizzed through that right at the end. <laughs> I was conscious of time. Brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Lindsay. It was fantastic. And uh, um, David uh, from the audience is doing a great job of asking questions directly before the most relevant speaker, which uh, I promise is not, uh, it's just pure coincidence and not a plant. So uh, thank you, David. I hope that uh, Kevin helped uh, touch on the beginning of the answer there for you. I think uh, Mark, MHRA marketing approval and CE marketing is quite a complex topic and so probably needs a, a more in-depth follow-up. But uh, Kevin and Lindsay are certainly the people that can do that for you. Um, so uh, I'm now going to move straight into our last but not least speaker, Elaine, um, who is uh, going to be talking about the Department for International Trade and more of the sort of wraparound business support that is available across the whole of the UK for companies that are attempting to access the UK. Thanks, Elaine. And thank you, Kevin and Lindsay. Thanks, Ben. Can, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Thank you. Good. Great. OK, so thank you. So as Ben said, so I'm from the Department for International Trade and I'm part of a, it's a dedicated 
inward investment team that specifically covers the north of England. Um, and it's an area that also gets called the northern powerhouse. So you, you'll see that in our, our team title. I'm the sector specialist in that team for life sciences. And I, I work closely with all of the organizations that you've heard to, from today and their counterparts right across the north. My job is to understand the, the strengths of all the different life sciences subsectors across the north and the related infrastructure so that I can make personal and relevant introductions for you um, according to the, the need of, of your company. So if I go to the next slide, so thank you. So today I'm going to summarize for you uh, why you should consider setting up a company in the UK, some of the particular strengths of the life sciences sector in the north, and I'll outline some of the specific services that are, you can access from my colleagues uh, within DIT uh, that are specific to um, for business needs. So if we skip on to the next slide, um, and the eagle-eyed among you will notice that there's an error in my slide. Um, at the population of the, the north of England is 16.4 is million. It hasn't grown by 3 million since um, the, the lunchtime when the, from the first presentation. Um, so, so that's the, the size of the region and the economy. Um, the, um, over the last decade, the life sciences sector has really been growing in the north of England. And in fact, there's been more people employed in the life sciences in the north than in London in the southeast over that period. There's a very rich ecosystem now of over 1,300 companies in um, that are companies and organizations in life sciences. The biggest subsector by turnover is biopharma, but in absolute numbers, there are nearly twice as many medtech companies as biopharma companies. So we thank you. Um, so now I'm going to switch from the north just to a more general overview of, of the UK as a place to set up your company. So from a financial perspective, the UK has some very attractive tax arrangements. It has the lowest corporation tax in the G20 countries at just 19%. There is zero withholding tax on dividends that, that you repatriate um, or that an organization repatriates to its overseas headquarters. And there's a, a particular range of tax reliefs available to investors. And I'm going to go in a little bit more detail in a later slide on those. From a science perspective, the UK is world renowned uh, for its education system and its innovative outlook. And we were ranked fourth this year in the Global Innovation Index. In addition to these advantages, the UK has a, a business-friendly visa application process. And from January next year, there will be a new points-based system to make it easier for UK employers to attract talent from overseas. So we have a team of specialists for each of these topics. So if we go to the next slide, please. So the Business Environment Advisory Team, so the BEAT team for short, um, they are, their role is providing direct support to investors and businesses by explaining the UK business environment and providing advice on the UK's competitive advantage. If you come up against any issues that are preventing you from establishing or from growing your business in the UK, they can work through those issues with you. Now, if we go to the next slide, please. So the, the BEAT team covers four aspects of the business environment that are particularly crucial to investors. So firstly, on skills, which is getting the right people people in the UK for your business. They provide advice on recruitment, um, for example, um, training and accessing apprenticeships, um, also accessing a longer term 
pipeline, so, so perhaps through engagement with schools. We have experts in that team who can help you with details of migration, so um, to help you get the right people from abroad, and they give advice on what are the relevant visas. There are specific experts on tax and banking and access to finance, and they can help you plan ahead before you've even set up a UK company just to work out what, how you should go about it and what might be the best approach for your company. And finally, there's a team that can help you to navigate the UK's research and innovation landscape. And in particular, uh, with regard to accessing grant funding opportunities. Although, um, as you'll have heard, uh, the speakers today are all have insights on this, and many of them will work directly with a collaboration partner to, to um, put together a grant application. So, um, thank you. So, the, then looking now in a little bit more detail on some of the tax schemes. The UK has, as it says here, it has, has a generous um, and internationally competitive R&D tax credit system. Uh, and it has different regimes for large companies and for SMEs. The research and development relief allows companies that are carrying out qualifying uh, R&D um, to, to be able to claim its an extra corporation tax de deduction for, for certain qualifying expenditure. But in practice, what that means is that companies are able to claim cash back against the money that they have spent on R&D. Under the patent box scheme, the corporation tax on profits earned from patented inventions and, and certain other intellectual property is set at a reduced rate of 10%. The schemes, it's been designed to encourage companies to, to keep their IP uh, in, in the UK and to, uh, to, to employ and people locally um, to, to, to commercialize that intellectual property. Then the, the schemes at the bottom, um, so the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme and Enterprise Investment Scheme, they both help high-risk startup companies to raise money. Um, they, they do this by offering tax relief uh, to individual investors who, who buy shares in your company, and that makes your company more attractive to uh, as an investment proposition within the UK to UK investors. So if you want any more information on any of those, those um, areas I've mentioned, you can get in touch with me because I can link you with the, the person who is the expert because I can assure you I'm not the expert on any of those. So having spoken about you know, the wider UK offer. I just want to now skip back on my next slide to one more reason why you should consider the Northern Powerhouse as a destination for your company. And that is the quality of life. Because in the North, uh, it was mentioned earlier as well, we have some of the most spectacular scenery in the UK. This, this picture is the Lake District and I'm showing it. This is where my family comes from, this is where I grew up. Um, but most of our northern cities are in ve within very easy reach of a beautiful natural environment where you can enjoy the outdoors. But on top of that, the cost of living in the north is significantly lower than in London and southeast. So that combination means you can have a very high quality of life in the north. There's a whole range of locations that you could look at as a company across the Northern Powerhouse that offer soft landing facilities for companies. Um, many of these are embedded within life sciences clusters. I can make connections for you to any of, of those. I mean, it's whether you're looking for maybe hot desking, you might want say clean rooms or access to an accelerator. You know, we have said so there's a whole range of those and Nexus was mentioned um, by Chris McKee earlier in Leeds. That's, um, uh, uh, so you've seen at least one of them. Um, but also linked to those, um, once you're in a particular region, 
there may be local financial incentives available from the local government in that in that part of the north. So again, I can help make relevant connections. And I know that, uh, again, mentioning Leeds, they have a particular programme that's called the Hashtag Welcome Scheme. So there's, a, there's Leeds has got a lot going for it. Um, so um, if there's anything else, if you skip to the next slide, um, so any questions you might have for me, do feel free to get in touch. Um, and I'll look forward to, to, to helping you with your decision making about coming to the UK. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you Elaine. And uh, thank you to all of our speakers today and also uh, to uh, our audience for uh, sticking with us through to the end. Um, I'm now gonna just hand over back to uh, Sam from the Tech Hub for our uh, sort of final closing statements. And uh, just a reminder that if you uh, want to have follow-up conversations with, in detail with any of the organisations that we've had today, our Health Tech Challenge is running and I'll be posting the link in the chat again in a minute. Uh, and that will um, sort of guide you to fill out all of the information that they need to triage you to the best people immediately. Uh, and we will try and help match make that as well. So but thank you once again to everybody, speakers and, uh, and audience. Thank you. I hand over to Sam. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, I, I won't take too long. It's been a, quite a long afternoon for, for everybody. I'd like to thank firstly all of the, the British speakers. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming and explaining you how your organizations work. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank the Israeli audience uh, for sticking with us, whether you've been with us for, for the full afternoon or you've dipped in and out for the parts that are relevant. Um, really, all I have to add here is, is again, as Ben said, you know, to, to apply for the challenge. One of the very nice things about this is that because it is needs led by the UK side, uh, it means that any of these one-to-one -one, uh, B2B meetings with the key decision makers are pre-validated. Um, you know, we've got no, no one has any interest in, in, in wasting anyone's uh, time on either side or, or mismanaging expectations. And this is one of the lovely things about this. So, and the reason they say that is ultimately, um, there's very little to, to lose from just applying, uh, submit your application, submit all the information that we request from you. Um, and I think that we'll be reaching out in the week of the, I think it's the 23rd of November uh, to establish, to set up those meetings. Those meetings will be taking place between the 30th of November and the 3rd of December. Uh, we've intentionally done that so that everything sort of gets closed up before uh, things start closing down over Christmas, um, which is of course a bigger issue in the UK than it is here in Israel. Um, but nonetheless, it is something that needs to be contended with. Um, so on that note, you know, feel free, I, I, I think we'll wrap up there. Feel free to reach out to, to me if you have any questions specifically, uh, if there's anything you'd like to know. If you don't already have my contact details, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and, and again, at the risk of repeating myself for the umpteenth time, and as Ben has said, please do submit applications. Uh, you know, share this with any other startups that you know that, that you think might be interested and might be relevant. Um, as you can see there, there isn't really such a, a competitive element. There's a wide variety of organizations looking for solutions in a whole range of areas. Um, so without further ado, I think I will, will wrap that up there. Uh, ben, do you have anything further to add or? or no, I think, that? thank you very, thanks Sam. I think we'll uh, let, um, let our Israeli uh, friends uh, go and have their, have their dinner. But thank you very much, everybody. I really, really appreciate it. And I, I guess also just to highlight that last point of, uh, as um, Lindsay and some of the others touched on, there are, while there isn't a direct funding stream, stream available with this challenge, there are funding streams available that uh, companies submitting to this can sort of filter into. And that's very much an intention of part of doing this. So uh, please do fill out those EOI forms as it will help us get you to the person you need to talk to as quickly as possible. And so thank you very much. And uh, once again, thanks, Sam. Thanks all the speakers. I look forward to talking to you all soon. Bye.